uh, IPTEC launched its uh, first uh, ever initiative in their uh, global outreach strategy in February 2021. Uh, so therefore, IPDET is very glad to welcome you to the first ever global outreach initiative within this network in cooperation with APIA and GPSC. This training consists of a series of sessions from 18th October to 11th November, and we are looking forward to an engaging event with you all. Today's session, use of evaluation for political steering and participation of society includes a theoretical presentation and a panel discussion. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our speakers to give the opening remarks. Our first speaker, Dr. Stephanie Krapp, is the head of the IBDAT at the University of Bern with more than 20 years of experience in monitoring and evaluation, particularly in the context of development cooperation. Dr. Stephanie, over to you. Thank you very much, Siti. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here and to open this first session on better policy through making, uh, um, making through evaluations. Well, IPDET is an internationally recognized training provider in evaluation, offering online workshops and an on-site program in Bern. Well, today we are here because IPDET is expanding its activities across the globe. This is guided by its recently developed global outreach strategy, as Hasiti already showed you, ensuring that evaluation capacity development reflects the local context. The activities are demand-driven demand and target decision makers and practitioners and national governments, civil society organizations and development organization, but also parliamentarians and their scientific staff. So today we are actually launching the first ever activity under the umbrella of IPDET's global outreach strategy. The session of various online events and one on-site event in 2022 for parliamentarians and their scientific staff in Asia Pacific are the result of a joint process between IPDET, the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association and the Global Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation. We have joined forces as we believe that parliamentarians play an important role in the field of evaluations, to use evaluation for your decision-making, to demand evaluations or to include evaluations into laws of national policies. So with this series of events, we want to contribute to strengthen your knowledge about evaluation. We are all very happy to be here with you all. And I would like to thank everybody from IPDET, the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association and the Global Parliamentarians Forum who made this possible. So I wish you all a successful series of events, enjoyable and interesting sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, now I would like to invite Honorable Kabir Rashim to address the audience. He's the chair of the Global Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation and a member of Parliament Sri Lanka. Honorable Kabir Rashim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor being here to, today. Uh, APIA and IPDE, along with uh, the Global Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation, uh, is creating history, I believe. This is the first time there's a training program uh, that's uh, involving parliamentarians and parliaments in the training program. So this is a, a great opportunity. Uh, I believe that in 2008, I think it was in 2008, I got the opportunity with Professor Ray Rich to go and do an IPDET training in Canada in Ottawa, and, and that opened up the door for me as a lawmaker to understand the power of evaluation. Ever since then, we've been trying to link the parliamentarians, the decision makers, the policy makers to understand that evaluation is an important, powerful, effective tool that we need to use and understand. Um, so as Nelson Mandela said, I have quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, unquote. So this is something that training it becomes very important. The training for parliamentarians and for parliaments, for officials in parliament, 
is a great innovative idea and it's a first step, but it's a great leap forward in uh, achieving the successes we want in evaluation. I've, I've been thinking that we've been able to bring parliamentarians into uh, the link of the, the evaluation world to work with evalu evaluators and it's becoming more common thing for us to be in the conferences, etc. But apart from the number one priority has always been uh, building the proper legal structure and the framework in a country that would accommodate evaluation within the law, within the constitution to establish a national evaluation policy. That would be a first priority, but I would say as an equal priority is capacity building, capacity development. That's something that has been an obstacle to move evaluation forward in every country. And therefore, what IPDEP is doing is an immeasurable step. And I would like to thank everybody, APIA and IPDEP for working with us to achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kabir. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Asila Kalugampidia. Asila is the current president of Asia Pacific Evaluation Association and Sri Lanka Evaluation Association. Over to you, Mr. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really happy to you know, speak in this event because this is a historical event as Honorable Kabir Rajiv also mentioned, because this is the first ever uh, training program uh, as part of the IPTAC regionalization program, as well as the first ever training for parliamentarians and parliament uh, research uh, unit staff. And this is the first ever training APIA, Global Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation, SEVAL, uh, the University of uh, Saarland, as well as uh, IPTAC uh, are organizing jointly. Uh, so this is uh, historical as well as we are really looking forward to uh, see you know this training is successfully uh, you know implemented and at the same time I can see many parliamentarians are many parliament uh, uh, staff have joined today uh, this is uh, uh, really a good news and good to see that and uh, APIA is looking forward to uh, this training. And at the end of the training program series, we hope to engage all the parliamentarians and parliament staff in uh, our work as well, because uh, this is also part of Asia Pacific Regional Evaluation Strategy, which has eight themes. And one of the themes is engaging parliamentarians in evaluation. And in this sense, this will continue. This is just the start. But at the same time, this will continue uh, with APIA regional uh, 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 evaluation strategy. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to uh, you know, uh, uh, have you know, this, uh, all the participants in this training program and uh, facilitate uh, uh, the learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asela. Uh, so our last speaker for the day is Dr. Alison Nevins, uh, Director General in Evaluation World Bank Group. Unfortunately, she can't be here with us today due to an unavoidable reason, but she has sent us a video message sharing her thoughts. Let's listen to her. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you on the occasion of this first regional IPDET event in collaboration with the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association and the Global Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation. Robust monitoring and evaluation systems are critical. They enable parliamentarians and government officials to assess the effectiveness of policy decisions and programmes, monitor progress towards national goals and course correct where needed. They provide citizens with much needed information on where and how and how well public funds are being spent. Evaluation also plays a key role in helping governments cope with crises and work towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. By supporting these functions, evaluation contributes to good governance, transparency and accountability, all of which are vital for achieving better development outcomes. There's a demonstrated need for evaluation capacity development. Many countries around the world still lack reliable data and monitoring and evaluation systems to track the progress of their policies and programs. 
Further, the COVID-19 crisis has emphasised the importance of data in effective policy making and the crucial role played by monitoring and evaluation systems in translating data into policies and programmes that can optimise the use of resources and reach critical target groups. Indeed, COVID-19 has increased global demand for monitoring and evaluation frameworks, while the mantra of building back better has at its heart the need to strengthen government's capacity to collect, analyse and use evidence to build on what works, as well as finding new solutions to the policy challenges of today. As one of the key partners of the Global Evaluation Initiative, a global partnership committed to strengthening country-led monitoring and evaluation systems and capacity development. IPDET plays a vital role in enhancing the capacity of evaluators, policymakers and commissioners of evaluation. Since its establishment 20 years ago, more than 4,000 professionals from across the globe have received IPDET training. This workshop series will be an opportunity for you to get a better understanding of why evaluations are important for good governance and why and how evaluations can help you make policies stronger and public institutions more accountable in your countries. We are thrilled to have you join us to learn and engage with the multidisciplinary and multinational IPDEC community and hope that the knowledge that you gain will help you in your journey to strengthen the link between evaluation evidence and policy making and ultimately to achieve better development outcomes for all. Thank you. Again, huge thanks to all our speakers. Now, I would like to introduce our organizing team. It was a great experience to work with this wonderful team for past few months. We are eagerly waiting to make this training a success with you all. Now, we have created a small video clip introducing our selected participants. Let's get to uh, know each other. That's okay. Great. Now it's time for our main presentation. I would like to invite uh, Professor Reinhard Stockmann to present on use of evaluation for political steering and participation of society. Professor Stockmann is a professor of sociology as well as founder and the director of Center for Evaluation at Saarland University. He has been involved in evaluation research with a focus on theory and methodology for more than 30 years and led numerous evaluation capacity development projects in African, Asian, and Latin American countries. Hello, good morning to everybody. Dear honorable members of parliament, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to make you aware of the subject of evaluation today. Before I start, first of all, I would like to tell you a story. So some time ago, I was having dinner with the Minister of Planning uh, of Costa Rica. It's a young and, and very engaged woman. My leading, she told me how she shocked her ministerial colleagues. It was about a strategic policy decision and the more experienced senior ministers wanted to make a decision based on tradition, as usual. Then the young minister who was attending the cabinet meeting for the first time presented figures and tables and study results with which she justified a different decision. She got the answer, hey, stop. That's not now we are doing politics here. But 
Yes, said the president, and supported the approach of this young planning minister and said, listen to her first. These changes in decision-making processes, which are based on objective facts, can be observed worldwide. And this is mainly due to the fact that political governance has changed in many countries because of the application of new concepts, such as evidence-based policy or results-based management. For the implementation of these new concepts, one also needs alternative information. And one way to obtain such information is evaluation. And um, that's um, why we want to address um, the following issue today. How can evaluation help to enhance the role of parliamentarians? Yeah, because you are key actors responsible for the development uh, of uh, your country. And that is why this question is so important. To answer this question, it makes sense to first have a look at the central tasks of parliamentarians. In addition to various other tasks, I think three fields are particular important. And that is making laws and policies, approving budgets, and your oversight or accountability function. And in order to fulfill these tasks, these tasks, parliamentarians carry out, yes, let's say various activities. They, they must gather information that serves as the basis uh, of their decision-making. They use this information for debates um, and for discussions in the parliament, for asking, specific questions and so, on, and so on, to finally uh, represent the interests of the citizens in the best possible way. Next, next slide, please. So um, before talking about um, the, the, before the, uh, I talk about the, the usefulness of evaluation concerning these tasks, I would like um, first to introduce you the concept of evidence-based policy. Well, the overall idea of this concept is that policy decisions should be based on objective evidence. So policy uh, should be based on facts and evidences and not longer on common sense, ideology, tradition, um, religious beliefs or whatever. Yeah, they should be based on facts and evidences because the assumption behind this concept is that political goals are best served when valid and reliable evidence is used uh, comprehensively to inform decisions. If you follow this assumption, then the challenge is where to get these valid and reliable evidences. Yes, evidences, or in, in other words, the facts and arguments that politicians need as a basis for their decision can be drawn from many different sources. So evaluation is only one of many. There are many others, like you can get information from studies, from official statistics, from your own personal experience. Colleagues will tell you, uh, will tell you things, and you can read books and you can listen to the media. So there are many, many evidences. Um, uh, next slide, please, but however, Evaluation claims to be a, a, a particularly a valuable source, a valuable source of information because the collection of information and the systematic assessment of this information is carried out according to special uh, scientific rules and that are intended to ensure the particular accuracy and objectivity of the information obtained. This means the evidences obtained from evaluations have a high degree of credibility. They are not equated with some opinions of which one does not know on what empirical basis they have been obtained. Okay, now we have talked a little bit about evaluation and now it's time to say, what is evaluation? And I present you here two 
uh, different uh, definitions. One is an academic one from Donna Martens, and she defines evaluation is the systematic investigation of the merit of an object, for example, a program for the purpose of reducing uncertainty in decision-making. And you see, there is another one uh, by the OECD and the, the DAC, and they say evaluation is the systematic and objective assessment of an ongoing or completed project, program, or policy, its design, implementation, and results. It's much more specific, and the academic one is much more uh, general. Okay. However, um, I think these two definitions give you an impression. What is evaluation for? But now, it's hip. It's it now, you can say, to use the, the results of evaluation in politics, which has led to an enormous evaluation boom worldwide. It is important not only to know what an evaluation is, but also what characterizes a good evaluation. Because many things are called evaluations without actually being evaluations. And with the help of the criteria, which I will mention here now, you can check for yourself whether it is a professionally, professionally sound evaluation with results then can be trusted or not. So what are these criteria? First of all, you should have a look if the evaluation object is clearly defined. So if you have an evaluation at hand and you read it, then have a look if the object is clearly defined. Is it a project? Is it a program? Is it, is, are they talking about a law, an organization? What is the evaluation object? First thing. Second, you should have a look at the people who have conducted the evaluation. Do they have specialized competencies? You can have a look at their references if they are experienced evaluators. A second important aspect. And then, Again, if you read the report, have a look if they have used checkable, measurable criteria. So first of all, these criteria they have used, for example, effectiveness, efficiency, impact, sustainability, or relevance, they have to be mentioned, they have to be made transparent, and they have to be defined very clearly. Why is that so important? Because if you use other criteria, or if you use other definitions of this criteria used, then you may come to very different results. So that's important to know at the beginning, okay, which criteria have they used? This has to be made very clear in a report. And if this is true, then that's a, a quality aspect of this evaluation. Okay, even if you are not an evaluation expert, you can have a look what kind of data collection methods they have used. If they have used only one method, for example, just doing some interviews, even if you're not an expert, you can say, okay, using just one method, that's a little bit poor. They should have used different methods. So even if you're not an expert in assessing the methods, if they have used them in the right way, you can say at least it's a quality criteria of this evaluation if they have used different methods. Another criteria is, um, okay, have they used in their analysis uh, systematically comparative methods? That's also a quality criteria of an evaluation. So for example, have they used before after comparisons or comparisons between beneficiary groups and non-beneficiary groups to make clear if the program makes any difference? And of course, at the end, you want that the evaluation questions are answered by the evaluation report, that there are rigorous and clear results for you, for you as reader, not for the scientists. The report is written for the users of an evaluation. So for them, it has to be clear if the evaluation questions are answered or not. And at the end, of course, this evaluation should, should help you should be useful for your decision making. If this is not the case, then you can say, that's not uh, the quality I expected from an evaluation. So next slide, please. 
So if you use, if you use this, let's say seven criteria, then you can assess by yourself the quality uh, of an evaluation. And for that, I think you, you have not to be an evaluation expert by yourself. You only need to check whether the evaluation you have at hand meets this, <laughs> these seven criteria. Now, next slide. Now, let's go back to our uh, central question. Our central question. How can evaluation help to enhance the role of parliamentarians? And let us recall the three central areas we have identified, and these were law and uh, policy making, approving uh, budgets, and this oversight or, let's say, accountability function. And let us know now, let us now go through these uh, task fields together and see how evaluation can be of use in fulfilling these tasks. And let us first have a look at uh, the first area, the use of law and policy making. Here, so-called ex ante evaluations, which are those carried out before the implementation or project or program or before the adoption of the law, can now provide an overview in advance of what impacts can be expected and for whom. And with the help of, of such evaluations, questions can be answered, for example, is the program really suitable for solving the identified problem to those uh, who are supposed to benefit, really benefit as a result of the program or law what negative aspects uh, are to be expected, how much money is required uh, for the measures uh, to be implemented, and questions like that. So parliamentarians who know how to use such evaluation results can convince others with arguments that are perceived as objective and credible, right? They can use this information to influence the political agenda, to play an active role in parliament debates, or to explain to others their political position, right? Such information can, of course, then also be used for budget decisions. Results, especially from evaluations of ongoing uh, projects, provide us even with more precise information to the question just mentioned then ex ante evaluations because now the program is running, right? In case of evaluations of ongoing programs, impacts and results can be data mined and assessed. And from this, one can get a picture of the success of a project or a program or policy, and then derive arguments for the continued funding of these measures. So that means parliamentarians can demand more money for successful strategies, or parliamentarians can rationally justify the rejection of or reduction of budget items. And by using evaluation evidence, parliamentarians can justify their decisions to the public. Next, please. Evaluations can also be used to support this oversight function of parliamentarians, right? So-called ex post evaluations are particularly suitable for this purpose. In other words, those which are carried out after the complement, the completion of a program or project. And these evaluations are particularly effective for checking whether the desired results have been achieved in a in a sustainable or long-term way. And this means being competent in using evaluation evidence strengthens the performance of parliamentarians in their oversight role and help them to fulfill their constitutional duties. Evaluation evidence can be used in parliamentary debates and is suitable for inquiries uh, to the government. Or thirdly, evaluation evidence can be made public to the citizens. This creates transparency and allows parliamentarians to start a public dialogue. 
Yeah. So what what's the um, what is the, the let's say the the, the, um, the take home message? What what um, if we summarize what we have learned today? What is that? Yeah. What is the what are the main messages? Namely, uh, if you look, what could help parliamentarians to use evaluations for what for? I think it becomes clear that evaluation results can be used in, in political debates to increase their visible performance in the eyes of their peers, um, in formulating uh, parliamentary inquiries to the government, in ensuring the assertion of their own political position in their party and in parliament, to legitimize their decisions and actions uh, towards their, the citizens or towards uh, their voters. In general, to place their own political decisions on, on a rational, more objective, less vulnerable place. To present themselves as well-informed politicians who competently represent the interests of their voters and should therefore be re-elected. So that means we are convinced of the fact that evaluation enables better policy. And therefore, personal capacity building in the use of evaluation is necessary to generate evidence for policymaking within parliament and your staff. And I promise you, IPTED will gladly support you with this. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Stockman, for that informative presentation. Uh, I think now our participants have a better idea on what is evaluation, how evaluation enables better policy making, and why capacity building in the use of evaluation is necessary. And now it's time for the Q&A session. Uh, since we are dealing with the limited time schedule, I will bring up the most voted questions really quickly. So the first would be, uh, is data collection the most important tool for evaluation? Okay, sir. Yeah, data, I would say data collection is one of the most important aspects of evaluation. But beside that, I think there, there are a lot of, of other important tasks. So the first is to ask the right questions. So before you start to collect data, you have you must have a very pre, you must have very precise evaluation questions. And then if you have the evaluation questions identified, meaning in what are the users interested in? What do the parliamentarians or other users of evaluation results really want to know? Then in the next step, you have to think, okay, how do I get this information? With which instruments, right? And then to know about the different data collection instruments is another important aspect. So the evaluators now should know which instruments to, to use. And then, of course, then the data, um, the, to get the data, the data collection phase is a, is a very important thing. But it's only one aspect, because having the data, then in the next step, you have to analyze them. You have to um, assess them. That means you have, the, the data have to speak to you. So say it in that word, so they have to speak to you. They have to interpret them according to the evaluation questions. Uh, and then to find out what, what's really the message in the data. And I think all this together is an important task. It's not only the data collection um, itself. Thank you. So the next question is, is it necessary to conduct its own evaluation for the parliaments? Mm. It is not necessary to do it, especially for parliamentarians. I think there are two ways. You know? Parliamentarians, of course, they can use existing evaluations if they are, if they are existing. Yeah. So they can say, oh, look, that's an important aspect. For example, we uh, today debate about a, pov a poverty reduction program in the parliament. So then the first thing I would do is to say, OK, are there any studies or especially evaluations um, which deal with this topic, with this topic no, about the reducing of poverty. And if there are evaluations about this, of course, then I would use them and say, oh, look, we have to, it's important to, have, to look at this aspect or other aspect, or the evaluations tell us which measures are very successful in the sense 
they are very effective or very efficient or whatever. But if there are no evaluations uh, of that kind, then I think it is very important that the parliament has the right to initiate evaluations. For example, in Switzerland, um, this is as well as a very well established instrument in the parliament so that they are allowed to initiate evaluations and say, look, we are very much interested now in the results of this program or that program. And so we want that this program is um, professionally evaluated so that we then can discuss it in the parliament, that we then can discuss if we will sponsor this project further on and things like that. The next question is, uh, in doing the evaluation, is it necessary to monitor the process how each program or activity is carried out? Okay, thank you for, for this question because you mentioned uh, a second term which I did not mention. It's a term monitoring. And, and actually monitoring and evaluation are two sides of the same coin. So you are right, well, it should be done. Uh, monitoring should be done for, um, for controlling the, the process of implementation. But, and that's a task of monitoring. And that's a different task as evaluation has. Because evaluation is not only looking at the results, yeah, what, has, what has been reached so far, um, according to some criteria I've mentioned before, if you look at the effectivity, if you look at the efficiency or the impact or whatever, but evaluation has also the task to uh, have a look at the objectives themselves. So to ask the question, are these objectives really relevant in the context uh, of our country, of our region, uh, of the subject, for example, poverty reduction, or should we do something completely different to reach our objective, for example, to reduce poverty? This is never a subject of monitoring. Monitoring is always, show, is always looking if we make progress in our special program. Yeah? And then if we make progress as planned, we will reach the objectives. But evaluation is doing an additional thing, asking, well, are these really the objectives we are should aiming at, yeah? or should we change the objectives? Because it will not work. And so evaluation asks the more principled questions. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how could a parliamentarian evaluate the pre-policy without a robust database? Engaging the relevant people will be enough or not? I think then, um, if I got the, the, the question right, I think um, there has to be um, al always the intention or the an, an initiative to get a robust data. And this is sometimes not, not easy, especially at the beginning of um, a law process or at the beginning in the planning phase of, of a program. And I think in, in that case, um, maybe more important than getting robust data is to be flexible, yeah? Not to say, okay, in the beginning, in the planning, uh, this is what we want to do and then uh, follow strictly this plan. Yeah? So especially at the beginning, to be flexible, to see, uh, to get data, of course, to speak with people, uh, to get different, different uh, information, and, but then to, uh, as a result out of that, to be flexible, yeah? not just following a plan. Because that is a, a lesson I think we got out of, let's say, 50 years of development cooperation that was at the beginning where was this very strict. Yeah? So um, the development organizations, they followed very strict the planning because the assumption behind was it, if I plan as careful as possible, then I will reach the goal. But they missed or they did not understand that the, um, the environment, the, the circumstances, that they can change rapidly and that I then have to adapt my, my planning, my program, even if the program is ongoing, yeah, um, I have to, to, to ad adjust to, to these um, changes. And this is why also monitoring and evaluation is, is so important 
in the implementation of a program because you have always have a look if the reality of the environment um, is still the same so that I can continue with, um, with aiming to the objectives to, to reach them or do I have to follow a complete different way? Because the environment, the circumstances, I mean, the social environment has changed uh, a lot. So then I have to react. And to know that, when to react, where to react, there uh, the information out of monitoring evaluation is a wonderful resource. Great, thank you, Professor. Since we are running out of time, uh, we will move to our next segment. Now, uh, if uh, we couldn't answer your questions, don't worry, uh, we will get back to those if the time permits. So our next segment is the panel discussion on experiences from the policy. I would cordially invite our panelists, Honorable Kabir Haji, a member of Parliament Sri Lanka, Honorable Natalia Nikitenko, a member of Parliament, Kyrgyz Republic, Ms. Josephine Watera, head of MNE unit of Parliament of Uganda, and uh, Professor Reinhard Stockman to moderate the session. Um, welcome to our esteemed uh, members of Parliament. Uh, it's wonderful that you will share uh, with us your experiences so that we can learn out of your experiences how uh, evaluation results can be used in parliamentarian work. And to know a little bit more about that, um, we have organized two, two rounds of questions. And uh, you have uh, four minutes time to answer our questions. And um, please understand that we have to be quite strict Otherwise, we will run out of time, and maybe we will not have enough time then for the second round. So the first round um, question is about the, yeah, let's say about the context, about the, uh, in, in your country, about the legal situation. So my first question is, uh, in, in your country, are there uh, legal regulations existing to use evaluations and does it happen? Because sometimes you have regulations, but, but they, they don't work. So do you have uh, legal regulations um, to use evaluations? And, uh, and, and, and does this happen? Are these evaluations are carried out? And secondly, um, are there opportunities to initiate and use evaluations by parliamentarians in your countries? Uh, so does the parliament pay attention to evaluations in do, do evaluation results play any role in parliamentary discussions? Does this happen? So that's the first, um, let's say, complex of questions where I would like to get an answer from, me, from you. So maybe um, I see, um, I see uh, Josephine, I think, uh, and um, maybe you like to start to answer this question. So thank you very much. And uh, I really do appreciate this opportunity. It's a great pleasure. I've been a member of IPDET. I was in IPDET in 2010. And I'll go direct to the questions that have been raised this morning. Okay. We have the monitoring and evaluation policy, a national M&D policy. And it clearly states the role of parliament, including the utilization of the results that have come out of evaluations. And this policy is spearheaded by the Office of the Prime Minister, which is our national body for evaluation in the country. We also have the national monitoring and evaluation strategy for implementation of the national development plan. So they also guide how uh, the plan of the, of, of the government should be implemented, the national plan. And mm -hmm. annually we have the national planning authority tabling the state of implementation of the national development plan. So it's a way of reporting and giving status of what is happening nationally. Our rules of procedure also require, for example, uh, as I go to the second question, the aspect of use and opportunities, that wherever a, a, a law is going to be introduced in parliament, there should be a, a kind of memorandum uh, to show that there is actually need of that legislation. And so we have kind of legislative uh, scrutiny that is undertaken before a law is introduced in parliament. This must accompany the introduction of the bill in the house. And then in terms of posts, and I appreciate very much, Professor Stockman, how you've raised uh, the, 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 the bar as we started. Post-legislative scrutiny is a very critical item in Parliament of Uganda. 
We undertake this to see the impact of the legislation that has been enacted over the last five years. And the research department is at the forefront of this. So evaluation is used at technical unit level. That is the research department, the, law, the budget office, and the legal department. Evaluation is used at committees to ask and raise important questions to the, to the public and especially the executive. Evaluation is used by parties or opposition, for example, is mandated to prepare alternative policy for the government. And so they use evaluation that is available within their means to, pre to, to raise alternative policies and strategies that government should be considering. So I'll stop here for now. And I would say that yes, for Uganda, we critique for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very uh, important, um, I think, input because, uh, as I know uh, from my visits in Uganda, uh, evaluation there in the parliament plays a very important role. And you may know um, that we helped one university in Uganda a few years ago to establish their master course in evaluation because we see that there is a, a big need uh, for evaluation in your country. And, um, and uh, that also on the side of the universities, there are a lot of activities, um, let's say, to, yeah, to educate people um, doing evaluation, high quality evaluations. And uh, I think this is, this is really, in, especially in Africa, um, uh, um, yeah, and let's say a, a very good example. Okay, so let's have a look uh, to, to other countries and uh, um, I, see, uh, I see here now Mr. Kabir uh, Ashim uh, from Sri Lanka, and I'm um, very interested. Um, what is your view of, um, of using evaluations in the parliament and if there are any legal uh, um, regulations in Sri Lanka to use evaluations? So what's the situation in Sri Lanka? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Stockman. Uh, your presentation was very uh, useful. Well, in Sri Lanka, there, uh, we've uh, been uh, having a regulatory system for evaluation for uh, many years. I would say as far back as 25 years, uh, there has been a structure for evaluation which is carried out under the Ministry of Planning. The framework is there, but whether it really gets right down to the ground and whether it connects to parliament was an issue because there is no, there was no national evaluation framework or no national evaluation policy which made it mandatory for mm -hmm. the use of evaluation. We uh, have managed to go through the transition from donor driven to country driven evaluations very much. That's the great victory. And the structure became strong. Uh, but come down to parliamentarians using evaluation, there were, there were and there are impediments which we have been trying to overcome. It's not only in Sri Lanka, but all over in parliaments, all over the world. The main issue was that, that there was, it was not mandatory for evaluations to be conducted and for evaluation reports to be submitted to parliament. And on number two, parliamentarians were not aware of evaluation, the, the concept of evaluation, and they hadn't got the capacity to understand an evaluation report. As you would know, an evaluation report is over 150 or 200 pages. And parliamentarians or politicians wouldn't have time to read it. Number three was that there was uh, no uh, capacity within parliament. As Josephine said, in Uganda, there is a unit now. These are the things that have developed. There was no unit in parliament that could look at an evaluation report and summarize it and interpret it in, in simple format for, a, for a, a two page summary for a parliamentarian to be able to go on the floor of parliament and read and look at that summary and read out from that report. So these are the things that we've been thinking of changing. Uh, uh, but evaluation as a concept is very, very uh, uh, familiarly used in Sri Lanka. It is. Uh, we are happy that now we have a draft national evaluation policy, which has been approved by our cabinet of ministers and which is now ready to be passed in parliament. So we're moving forward. Okay. Okay, thank you uh, very much, um, Mr. Kabir Hashim. Um, you, I think you mentioned a very important aspect. You say there are evaluation reports um, with 200 pages and the parliamentarian could not read it. 
And that is maybe another uh, quality uh, criteria for an evaluation report. Of course, an evaluation report should have something like an executive summary, which is two or three pages, so that especially a parliamentarian has not to read the 200 pages of the report. No, he can have a few at this um, executive uh, summary. And uh, I would say that's an, a, another additional criteria for the quality of an evaluation report. Of course, this should have um, such a summary. But as you said, um, it's very promising what uh, happened in Sri Lanka. And uh, we will see uh, how this will change in the next years. And um, also in Sri Lanka, I think we, um, there is some support also from the universities. So a few years ago, um, I was able to, to, um, yeah, to, to, to found a, a center for evaluation at the university um, where uh, also Azela is teaching. And I think uh, out of my personal impression um, that also things are, uh, are really improving in Sri Lanka. So, but I have no idea what's going on in the, um, in the Kyrgyz uh, Republic. So we are, are very interested uh, to hear now what Natalie um, um, Nikitenko will tell us how the situation is in her country. Natalia, Hello please. Hello everyone, uh, Honorable Professor Stockman, thank you so much for this rich presentation and discussion. And uh, definitely in Kyrgyz Republic, we are really young democracy. Uh, we have some elements of evaluation during 20 years on the level of government units in the ministries, etc. But we came up to the framework on the level of the special law on monitoring and evaluation seven years ago. I was one of the initiators as member of the parliament. We worked together with VOPE. Uh, professional organization for evaluation and uh, developed this special law on monitoring and evaluation and adopted it in 2014. So the major things and aspects of this law, they say that evaluation should be used on the national and local level on the level of the parliament and government. It should be mandatory and it should be publicly mm, like presented to the public. So the results of evaluation should be implemented and discussed. And we thought that's the key. Now we have law and life will be better. We'll have more uh, step forward to implement evaluation. But actually it took other five years to build the capacity after the framework and having this special law. During these five years in our country, we built uh, on the governmental level some um, policies, how to implement evaluation on ministerial level. And last year was very important from the point of view of involving the parliament and members of parliament more actively in this agenda. Because honestly speaking, just a few members of parliament were uh, just aware of the evaluation agenda and definitely were not very much involved. But um, last year, working with the law, with Global Parliamentarian Forum, exchanging the experience, we built a special strategy for evaluation for the parliament. And uh, we also implemented the strategy and piloted for the special state programs and the laws. So this uh, parliamentary strategy states then that each parliamentarian committee should mandatory select at least one legislation, one piece of legislation or law per year at least one governmental program and organize evaluation. So parliamentary committee organizes the working group, involves professional evaluators, government officials, uh, staff of the parliament, members of parliament, identifies the law or the topic more crucial, important for the country, for this committee uh, functions, etc., and organizes evaluation. And part of this policy is important, the use of evaluation. So, the results of this evaluation will be presented on the committee level and on the chamber level. And we also have pretty good, interesting results out of that policy so far. But we are actually um, framing, still in the process of framing, let's say, our national evaluation agenda. But yes, we have the law, we have the policy, we have the strategy. 
And inside the, inside the parliament, we also have the special research unit that, uh, which collects existing evaluations from international partners and donors, evaluation society, and each member of parliament can actually address the research unit and request evaluations for these or that topic. So it's very interesting what you said in your presentation regarding like the ex ante and ex post evaluation. And oh. ex ante evaluation we included in the law. So before the initiating the law or amendment, uh, in the declaration to this law, in the, um, there should be the special part saying that evaluation was done for this, um, let's say, new amendment and law, the expectation, some um, steps of evaluation. As for ex post evaluation, we also included in the parliamentary policy the uh, using of evaluation for oversight function and uh, implementing this policy, try to cover this ex post evaluation um, agenda. Thank you. Well. Um, thank you very much, um, Natalia. This is this is very impressive what has developed um, in the Kyrgyz Republic in the last few years. That sounds really great. And um, if I have a look at your three statements, I think uh, there um, is one thing in common that um, evaluation in all the three countries, even if they're very different and in a different uh, locations in the world that there is um, um, the understanding that evaluation is of high importance and that of course in a different degree all the countries have developed um, evaluation structures have institutionalized evaluation and that's, that's I think uh, very interesting to see how this development will continue in the next years but I think one thing is, is very clear and common that in all countries the parliamentarians um, and the governments uh, have understand uh, that uh, how important evaluation is for, um, for, for the government and for, poli for policy decision making. Thank you very much for this very interesting insights. Now, uh, let um, me ask you more personally how you uh, have already used evaluation results. So have you really used evaluation results for your policy decision making it would be nice here to get um, to get some examples uh, how you have used them and how useful it was for your policy decision making um, personally right if it was convincing others in debates or in discussions or to inform the public or to ask um, questions to the government or how in, in, in whatever um, uh, sense. So that would be my first question. How you personally already have used uh, evaluation results and what for? And secondly, what are your suggestions for parliamentarians to request and assign evaluations and to use evaluation results for their work? What should they do? And uh, maybe the third aspect of my, my question is what are the existing obstacles for this and how could they be overcome so that in the future more parliamentarians will use evaluation results for their decision making. Maybe um, we take uh, the same order and, uh, and uh, Josephine uh, from Uganda can tell us her personal experiences about this. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And just a, a minute to tell you that the program that you started in Uganda, I'm a beneficiary. I undertook that master's in monitoring. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's nice Thank to you hear. So much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So in terms of specific uh, experiences, um, I would point, uh, we've had a program called the Youth Livelihood Program. Uh, for the youth to empower youth to come out of uh, states of vulnerability due to aspects of unemployment. And this was designed in 2013 and approved by parliament in 2014. So we started having uh, petitions from the youth talking about issues of access, the methodologies that were being used to give out the money to the youth. And the research department of parliament in 2016 initiated the process evaluation and uh, after this engagement with the stakeholders, the Ministry of Gender, 
that hosts this program and then the youth who were like the, the primary beneficiaries of this program. Uh, the results came back to the Committee on Gender of Parliament and the Committee on Gender engaged the ministry uh, to, to revise the mechanism of access for the, for, the, for the youth. And now we see an increase in terms of how many youth are able to access the resources. We see sustainability in terms of the understanding of the, of the program and payback uh, of, the, of the monies that have been advanced by the youth. And also we see a better intake of this program vis-a-vis -vis what we're seeing before. So arising from this process evaluation that came from the research department and the different engagements, we see that the youth level program is now a better uh, achieving its objectives and the goals that uh, we set out to reach out to the youth. In terms of what more can we do for parliamentarians, uh, I think aspects of timing are very important and then I'm tying this also with issues of challenges and what we should do. So parliament has specific legislative agenda like for our case, we have a specific period that is more about budgeting. We have a calendar that is following uh, uh, a specific government uh, timetable for budgeting. So if information that relates to budgeting comes in after uh, this cycle has passed, then we have lost out. So as evaluators, it's important that we bring in our information when in, in time. The information should be context specific. We need to see where is this issue and what evaluation can inform this process. We've talked about packaging. We've talked about the reports, which are 200 pages, and our research department engages in undertaking policy briefs. So beside the big evaluation reports, we unpack this into four pages policy briefs to help the members of parliament debate on the floor of the house, and then just refer to the report for, 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 for other issues where need arises. Uh, issues of accessibility are very important. So this has been one of the challenges that many members have been talking about. And so it's one of the areas that I will talk about as, as ways of improving uh, what can, we can do more for parliament. Of course, we have a big challenge of party domination. Uh, when you come from, 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 from political systems that are having a, a big dominant party, then the side of opposition, which may want to use evaluation, sometimes it is disadvantaged. But for us, we have a law that is specifically clear on the role of the opposition in the, in the policy agenda. And so we have that opportunity to influence, even when evaluation is not used by the government side, evaluation can always be used on the opposition side. You, we still have a mechanism for getting this evaluation through. We have aspects of partnerships and collaboration, which are very important. It's important that we have uh, centers that we can always refer to who can give us authoritative uh, information. I will finish with an aspect of capacity building. We need to continuously build the capacity of members to appreciate and understand the need for, for evaluation and the difference it makes uh, Uganda has the, 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 the African version of APNOD. APNOD is Africa Parliamentary Network on Development Evaluation. We have the Uganda chapter that brings together members of parliament. It's also an, a, an African hand of the, G, of the GPFE uh, under well, the, the Africa Development Bank. So they help countries and special members of parliament to understand and appreciate the need of evaluation. So if any of us comes from these countries that have not considered having these platforms within your systems, it's important because it's, it creates a center for debate on the use of evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Josephine. And then I will directly hand over to Gabi, to Kabir Hashim to hear his experiences. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Well, uh, there were two questions uh, you asked Professor Stockman and I think Josephine threw a lot of light on it. And from my side in Sri Lanka, I will say yes, personally, yes, as a politician, as a policymaker, a number of times, but I would give one example where we uh, uh, used uh, evaluation for our benefit. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, the then government uh, set up a structure for uh, KPIs uh, with regard to gender issues. Uh, 17 issues were targeted and the Ministry of Women's Affairs and the Ministry responsible for Sustainable Development Goals was uh, given the responsibility of uh, ensuring that these KPIs were achieved. So in 2021, this year, a couple of us parliamentarians wanted to look at whether these targets were achieved, what happened? And we, we were very concerned about these gender issues. And we found uh, the result was that, except for two of the KPIs that was achieved, the rest 
had not been achieved. So we could take this up in parliament and raise these questions and find out why this had not been monitored, why this had not been achieved and what steps would be taken. So this became a very useful uh, exercise because lots of people began to understand the usefulness of uh, the process of evaluation itself. And that was one of the things that helped us. So the suggestions for parliamentarians to, uh, to request and assign evaluations and the obstacles that are there. The obstacles are many, as I said, you know, the, the having uh, a legal structure, making it mandatory becomes important because unless it's mandatory, both policymakers and officials don't respond, don't think that it's need, necessary to uh, process evaluation. Plus, there is never a budgetary allocation for evaluation if it doesn't become mandatory. So national evaluation policies may not be the uh, end in itself of all problems, but it is a necessary thing. So that was one of the things that we, we were fighting for. So one of the, one of the things we did was uh, the process of overcoming these obstacles was in Sri Lanka that we uh, set up a, a a select com a committee, a parliamentary select committee under the deputy speaker who is powerful enough to ensure that evaluation structure is established to overcome these obstacles. And our select committee actually proposed lots of things and we made a report that came out where we developed a national evaluation policy draft which was submitted to parliament, uh, to cabinet and cabinet approved it. Now it's awaiting approval in parliament. So that was one of the things of the select committee. Then we also had proposed a national commission for evaluation, which was an independent body with wide powers so that there wouldn't be any bias towards the national evaluation policy uh, uh, implementation. And uh, we also have found that uh, we, uh, we've identified that uh, we recommended professionalization of evaluation in the country because you needed capacity. And the parliament managed to coordinate uh, with uh, the universities in Sri Lanka. And we have now uh, uh, diplomas and degree programs being offered in our universities, which is a great victory to overcome capacity. We've also worked on building the capacity within parliament, because if you don't do that, like even uh, though we spoke, to, uh, spoke about lengthy reports and a summarization, if every parliament has a research department and that research department has to be empowered, has to be trained and skilled in evaluation so that that department will be able to look at every evaluation report that is out in the country, brought to parliament to the research department and a summary made and made available to parliamentarians for every debate. So we have started training our staff in-house in parliament. And they are now become they, they are able to look at evaluation reports, do a summary, and give it over to Parliament. So we are moving forward hugely in this respect. And uh, we have proposed establishing a permanent standing committee in Parliament for evaluation, like the Committee for Public Enterprise or Committee for Public Accounts. We have proposed a standing committee for evaluation because then that committee will make sure that evaluation is strengthened within parliament. So basically, we I would like to say also we spoke, we uh, the Global Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation had this uh, uh, the, the uh, global conference in Sri Lanka in 2018, and we came up with the Colombo Declaration. The Colombo Declaration is a roadmap to take away these obstacles. If you follow the roadmap, yeah, the Colombo Declaration spells it out. There were 78 parliaments that were involved in it. There were international agencies. There were the war pairs. They were all involved in developing the Colombo Declaration. So the takeaway, I would finally say, is one is legislate national evaluation policy. Two is ensure a permanent standing committee uh, within parliament for monitoring and evaluation in every parliament. Three, to ensure that there is in-house training of staff in parliament, the research department, so that they can read and interpret evaluation reports and summarize it and give it to parliamentarians. Then uh, in order to have sufficient qualified trained professional evaluators in the country to have capacity building, to start university programs locally so that there'll be internal capacity building. And finally, uh, to have the national evaluation 
have policy in place and to have a national evaluation commission which is independent uh, to regulate monitoring and evaluation. Thank you. Mr. Hatshim, thank you very much for this very clear and impressive strategy for uh, developing uh, evaluation in the future and um, for, for, yeah, for creating um, better conditions for using evaluations in the parliament. I think this is very impressive and uh, I think uh, we all uh, wish you uh, the best success. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. And uh, so the last statement um, is for um, uh, Natalie Nikitenko, please. How uh, are your, what, what are your personal experiences? Thank you. Definitely, uh, I used evaluation and uh, I try to convince my colleagues, first of all, to explain them why it is important. Why we should, and uh, actually it's our mission as parliament, keep the government accountable and efficient, effective, open. And just to demonstrate the real use and practice, um, I tried to use the existing evaluation during the debates in the parliament, on the committee level, on the chamber level, and explaining that there should be um, involvement in using the results of evaluation. Please use our research unit in the parliament please request existing evaluations to equip your uh, speeches in the parliament with data evidence-based rather than just uh, populistic, like notes, etc. And then the second thing that uh, when I tried to convince the colleague to support the policy on evaluation for the parliament, uh, actually I am as a chair chairperson of the committee on uh, law enforcement, combating crime and corruption, I used uh, the platform of my committee, which I chair, to um, pilot evaluation for the law on domestic violence and uh, uh, law on offenses prevention and crime prevention. So we selected this law because the situation with domestic violence is far from the good in my own country, unfortunately. And we organized the whole evaluation process. After that, we had the discussion, several rounds of discussion on the committee level come up with evaluation report and then present it on the chamber level. Uh, after that, we actually came up with um, uh, like evidences that the law should be reviewed and the new edition of the law, not even the amendment, but the new um, redaction of the law was uh, developed and offered based on the evaluation process. So that was pretty interesting uh, tool to convince the colleagues to use the tool to actually to test and pilot the guidelines that we created for the parliament and parliamentarian committees because we come up to the very clear guidelines what should the committees do to organize evaluation process and how after that they should use uh, the results of this evaluation. And uh, I also, uh, we use this um, strategy and guidelines uh, within the parliament for law about social aid for poverty groups. And um, right now we're using this regarding the national program on healthcare, trying to implement the new uh, challenges uh, due to the COVID. So we have some, uh, not very maybe big portfolio, but I used to, during my parliamentary career on the regular basis and convince colleagues and tell about that. Regarding the suggestions for my colleagues for parliamentary, uh, so I'm sure, I'm sure that it's very important what Honorable Kabir Hashim mentioned, and I'll fully join the statements because, first of all, there should be leadership inside the parliament on the MP level, the people who understand why evaluation is important, why the agenda, convince the colleagues. Actually, they act, they do something, they implement and show the examples to other colleagues, uh, they involve, etc. So leadership, then institutionalization. When it was not mandatory for the parliamentarian committees, it was on the voluntary basis. This tool was not very much used in the parliament. That's unfortunately the truth. So there should be uh, policies, the legislation, the framework that requests using of evaluation on the regular level as mandatory and uh, implement the results of evaluation. 
the next step is definitely capacity building inside the parliament. It is crucial. Trainings for the staff, now meetings with MPs. And here, I believe that Global Parliamentarian Forum is very important tool and resource for networking, to build the networks between the members of parliament and parliaments all over the globe. Because really practically, it helped my country, me personally, to build the capacity very seriously. And I would recommend look at that uh, Columba Declaration because it's really the very good and uh, very reliable roadmap how to build uh, and rise evaluation agenda using the national context of different countries and parliaments. I really relied a lot on the uh, Columba Declaration to build them inside our parliament, the policies and strategies. And it's important to have the national relation policy and also involve universities and voters because parliaments can work separately, have their own units, etc. But if there is no networking, building and regular connections with voter involvement in the process, uh, I don't think it will be uh, sustainable. And budgeting, it's very important to have the budgeting for evaluation on the level of the parliament, the government. As for the obstacles, definitely I would say that sometimes it's resistance. Uh, I, I can tell about my country because we as emerging democracy, we had three revolutions for 25 years of independence and for 30 years of independence, we changed 32 governments. You can see the picture. So. Um, there is not so much sustainability on the level of the government and parliament, and it's not very easy to keep the institutional memory. That is why the um, political context is very important. Having the leadership on the political level, rising the agenda of evaluation is important because there are anyway some resistance in our context, for example, the government, they are not interested to give sometimes the real information to the people, to the parliament about the situation with budgeting, with the lack of results on several pro different programs. That is why it's important when the government is equipped with evaluation and requests the government be uh, open, be responsible and be accountable. Uh, and definitely there is the political resistance it might be. And usually evaluation in, in our context is used more actively by opposition parties. But uh, I think that another obstacle is definitely budgeting and lack of capacity, lack of information. So networking, informing, building the capacity and uh, uh, taking uh, like um, out of the political context, but more using the valuation as the tool for policies is very crucial, I think. And I would really say that evidence-based policy should change and replace uh, populistic politics. So we should maybe orientate to the uh, evidence-based politics, not just policy, but politics in the bigger context. So th that would be my uh, observation. Thank you. Thank you so much. So esteemed parliamentarians from Uganda, Kyrgyz Republic and Sri Lanka, thank you so much for your precise, constructive and also open and, and frank statements. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experience uh, with us. I think we have learned a lot. Thank you so much for your recommendations for a better use of evaluation in the future and for overcoming, also for mentioning some of the obstacles and how to overcome uh, these obstacles which hinder a better use of evaluation. So I think these are very promising uh, developments and um, I thank you very much for your very engaged um, activity in this field of evaluation. And so now I will hand over uh, to Hashiti because she will moderate the Q&A session. Hashiti. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Due to the uh, limited uh, time, I'll quickly take the questions uh, with Tyre's words. Uh, the first question for the panel would be, uh, members of parliament will not see the great number of pages of evaluation. Is there any suggestion? How can we make our evaluation impressed or read by our target person? So well, that, that was one of the key things we were speaking about, uh, about uh, evaluation reports being lengthy, uh, complex and technical. And for an ordinary, uh, for a parliamentarian, he may not be able to understand what's in it. 
So that's why we spoke about this IPDEP training will help parliamentarians to mm -hmm. get uh, to, uh, uh, to some extent be trained, but parliamentarians keep changing. So every five years, it's not a permanent job, new people come. Therefore, capacity, if capacity in parliament is built, the staff in parliament, uh, the research department are familiar with evaluation. They take the report, read the report and interpret it and summarize it in a few pages and present it to their parliamentarians. So parliamentarians are able to, for, for whatever subjects they are shadowing, they'll be able to read the relevant evaluation reports, the summarization of it, and be able to take it up in parliament in a debate or to engage with the public and to tell them whether their project has achieved their goals or not. That's how uh, we think is the way forward. Thank you, Honorable Kabi. So there's the next question is for uh, Charles Pien and again for Honorable Kabir. Uh, do you have separate parliamentary committee for monitoring and evaluation? Oh, monitoring and evaluation is task of all parliamentary committee as in NEPA. For Uganda, uh, thank you for that question. For Uganda, I'll say we do not have a separate committee. All committees uh, have the responsibilities of monitoring and evaluation, but we have the, the, the network, the Africa Parliamentary Network on Development Evaluation, Uganda chapter, to also bring members together. So we don't have a specific committee. Yeah, for, for, for Sri Lanka, it's the same as Josephine said, we don't have a separate committee, but uh, about four years ago, we established a parliamentary select committee to be able to brief the speaker on the changes that should be made. And we have recommended there should be a standing committee, a permanent committee on evaluation separate, like the uh, different permanent committees for public enterprise or public accounts. We've recommended that there should be a parliamentary standing committee for evaluation because it has become such an important tool for us. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, I'll uh, move to the next question with Honorable Natalia. Uh, governments and politicians would always want to project that they are doing something, not necessarily the right thing. How do we convince politicians with this mindset on the importance of evaluation? Thank you. And uh, this is what I mentioned before. It's very political context. Governments uh, not very often are open enough, especially if it's not like very open society or very strict monopoly or presidential administration, etc. So it's a tricky situation because the role of the parliament actually is to keep government accountable anyway on the reviewing the budget level or some other different levels. So it's important to create and establish inside the parliament, the group of politicians. It might be one political like group of group from different political parties, etc., who understand the role of evaluation and use it as a tool and asking the government. Uh, for example, most of the parliaments, they have a special inquiries to the government, a special days or hours when government ministries, they come to the parliament and they report or they answer the questions on the report on inquiries. So using this tool based on evaluation and addressing that to the colleagues and to the government using the evidences, the data uh, will actually be uh, should be kind of the uh, practice and uh, should be the good example for other members of parliament. But if institutionalized, for example, like we try to do within the parliament and institutionalized on the committee level, it will be the mandatory tool. And the governments will know that when they come to the parliament, when there are inquiries, it will be based on the evidences. And it's very tough and difficult to uh, not to open up the information. Uh, so it's kind of the level of uh, implementation on the parliamentary level, the quality of implementation of evaluation will play the major role. But there are the parliaments which already have this oversight function by law, by constitution. So they should be used, just equipped properly. Yeah, great. 
So a huge thanks to our panel for that wonderful and interesting discussion. Uh, since we are running behind the time, uh, we have to move to the next segment. And if uh, we couldn't answer your questions, again, don't worry. Take your opportunity by joining us for the next session. So um, now we have come to the end of today's session. I hope you all learned something new and interesting on how to use evaluation for political steering and participation of society. I would now like to invite Professor Reynard Stockman to give a short summary on today's session and the closing remarks. Professor, the floor is okay. yours. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Don't, don't, don't expect now a summary from my side. But I just um, want to say that um, it was really fantastic uh, to hear about um, how the development of the institutionalization of evaluation is driven forward by you personally and in your countries. And I think that's, that's very, very promising for the future. And I also would like to thank you for your recommendations. And I think we will focus on some of them as we can do, for example, we can support the, net, the idea of networking, of capacity building, and also yeah, establishing, let's say, a floor, a platform uh, for sharing experiences and ways how to institutionalize evaluation uh, successfully. And uh, I just can tell you that if that is ready, um, to gladly support you uh, by that. And... Um, Thank you very much um, for, for these uh, experiences, for sharing these experiences and these uh, recommendations. And so I'm in a very positive mood um, if I look at the future and the future development of the institutionalization of evaluation. Thank you so much for participating in this session and uh, for listening to us, for asking um, your questions and of course to our panelists to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesca, for all your efforts to make today a success. And again, a huge thank goes to our speakers and the panelists for their valuable inputs. And of course, our wonderful participants for their active engagement throughout the session. So uh, as you can see, our next session uh, will be on uh, 26th of October, and this will be for our selected participants. So, but Others can join us on the 2nd and 11th of November for another two most interesting sessions. So don't miss this opportunity. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, please keep in touch. See you in the next session. Stay safe, everyone.